Hello and welcome to WEC Talk, the podcast series from the FIA World Endurance Championship. I'm Martin Haven. In this episode, my guest is a South American driver who moved to Europe for his junior career before making his mark in the USA more than 20 years ago. He was part of a unique driver swap between teams on opposite sides of the Atlantic. He became the youngest ever kart champion. He's won the Indy 500 twice and the Daytona 24 hours three times. He's racked up nearly 300 stock car races and more than 90 Formula One Grand Prix. Welcome, Juan Pablo Montoya. How are you? Very good. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm doing pretty well. Well, as I said in the intro, you made your home in the States more than two decades ago. Most of your racing career now has been in the USA. Even your last Formula One Grand Prix was in the USA. But there's so much racing opportunity in America. You you almost don't need to leave, do you? And you still can have a fantastically varied career. Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky, lucky enough to to been able to race in both sides of the pond. Um, so that that really makes a difference. So I'm you know pretty happy with that. Uh, at the same time, you know it's it's been fun. You know I've been based in in the states for quite a long time now, and now with Dragon Speed moving back to Europe, it's it's been exciting. You know, Spa was a lot of fun to race. It was a lot of work for us, uh, but at the end we had a competitive car, and 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 honestly, I really enjoy the weekend. Really enjoy racing back in Europe and. You know, this year is is really special for me, uh, getting to go to so many cool places. Uh, you know, we go from Daytona to Indianapolis to Spa to, I mean, you name it, going back to Monza again, going to Le Mans again this year. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I got to say, I kind of fall, fallen in love with Le Mans from the last two times I've been there. It's been the race, you know, the racing there has been so much fun. You've not been an international racing driver in terms of leaving the, the continental US for a long while. Was it, was it weird to be kind of jet setting off to Europe again? Uh, I've been going a lot to Europe. My kids been racing karting there for the past few years, three, four years, probably at least or nearly five, I would say. Yeah. So going to Europe, it, it was kind of common the last probably five, six years, um, but not racing. It was different. You know, you it's funny because you criticize racing here and the stewards here and you go there and is and you end up in the same boat and uh, you know the way they look at things and their opinions and things so you got to learn the ropes and understand how everything works in both sides it's not too different drivers always have one opinion and officials tend to have a slightly different opinion quite a lot of the time don't they um it, it's difficult because it's always a balance between, you know, you do understand you got to risk a little car and everything, but the little cars tend to take a lot of advantage out of that. So you end up always in crossroads, but it's what makes sports car racing fun. You know, it's part of what it is and dealing with the traffic. And, and you know, in, in our case, you know, we have Hendrik that is a, a bronze driver and and, and that's a, a fun twist, to be honest. Uh, you know, having Hendrik in the car has been a lot of fun. And, you know, working with to try, you know, make him go faster and, you know, showing him all the details. And it, it's just a different way of approaching races. But it's, it, it, you know, honestly, a spa with them was a blast. You know, they've been a great team so far. Well, what about Spa? I mean, obviously, you, in your mind, you have memories of it. You had a Formula One podium there with Williams, but that was 15, 16 years ago, 2005, and you haven't been back much since. So what was it like after 15 years away? How much did you remember and how much did you go, oh, that's different from the last time I was here? I did track walks, actually, like maybe four or five years ago, four years ago. I did a couple, I went a couple of FIF3 events. So I've done a few track walks there and everything. So it hasn't changed that much. You know what I mean? It's just more runoffs. Um, that is kind of the tendency nowadays, you know, and that's a bit of a the dilemma you have now with track limits. Yeah. You know I mean, you're trying to make the tracks sterically safer, but, you know, you're putting yourself in a bad situation for, for the track limits, you know, kind of, kind of stupid, to be honest. 
and a little bit of a rare weekend, it didn't rain on us once. I mean, you know, that's that's kind of yeah, cheating. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> next time yeah, it'll be... Yeah, fun, don't get wet. Yeah, next time it'll pay back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, so that's where we are so far. You know, you already started with, with Daytona, with Sebring and, and so on. And so the, the IMSA WeatherTech series has been up and running long before we were able to get started in Europe. But what about young one? Where did motorsport come from in your veins? Did you grow up in a motor racing household? Was it something that happened? Was, was your dad a big fan or, or how did it start? Well, my dad used to race go-karts, grew up racing go-karts. Um, I mean, he didn't grow up racing go-karts. He became, you know, he started racing go-karts when he was, when was it? He was, he was like 29 or something when he started racing. And, and just after I was born, so I used to go to the races, you know, he used to take me to the races and, and, and he became the importer of Burrell in, in Colombia back in the day. And, you know, we all got started, uh, you know, and, and the rest is, you know, ancient history. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's obviously the connection where it all starts. So often it's a dad or, or an older brother who is who is taking you to the tracks. And then you started racing locally, you started racing in carts, but then you were also racing not just in Colombia, but also in the US and in Mexico, all while you were still trying to study your, your last few years of study. So that that's kind of an intense time for, for any driver, right? But you got to remember back in the day, there was really no internet, no cell phones, no nothing. So it, it was different. You know what I mean? It, the school, uh, the, you know, the school were very, where I went, they were very helpful. Uh, at the beginning, they were in a bit of a shock and that I needed to travel so much, but they, you know, they understood and they helped. And, and I think that made it easy, you know, in a way, um, I honestly, like I didn't grow up. I went to two world championships, junior world championship of karting. And that, that's where my international karting races, I didn't do anything else. And, and from the car's point of view, as you said, you know, first time I went out, I started going to the States and, and I got a chance to race in Mexico and some prototypes that is still to my mind, one of the most fun cars I ever driven. They were so cool. Um, and, you know, as you said, you know, that's where the last few years of school and the year after I finished school, I moved to, to England and to race for Paul Stewart. So what was that like? Because obviously it's a big step to, to move completely away from your family, away from your friends, all your support to head to a country well, freezing cold, pouring rain. What was it like that first season in Formula Vauxhall? It was difficult because I, my English level was really, really low. Uh, and I went to live by myself. And, you know, what I mean, at those times, and I wasn't that young. I was, that was 95, I was 19. But, you know, 19 at the time when you don't have a phone, you have no connections to anybody. It's not like nowadays, you know, my kid is 16, just turned 16, and he can go by himself and do things. And he's, you know, it's so much simpler today and, and so much early they do it nowadays. But it was it was a bit of a shock. It was pretty cool. Uh, I had a, a steep learning curve with the team. And at the end of the season, I was really strong. So I was really happy. Yeah, you finished in third place in your rookie season. And then you moved through British F3 and into Formula 3000. Now, that was the big proving ground. And you joined forces with Helmut Marco's team runner-up in your first year one and a half points behind Ricardo Zonta of course went on to be a Mercedes factory driver and then you showed your full talent in 98 with Supernova you won the championship and you're still the only man to have lapped the entire field in a Formula 3000 race that was a, that weird one at Poe with a big <laughs> crash at Foch right yeah but the weird thing is the first year we had no incident and I won by 40 seconds and it was a minute 10 lap so the weird thing is, yes, the, the accident happened at the beginning. I had like a, like a crazy like 30-second lead on the first lap. And then after that, I still you know, got to them, lapped them, and put like 20 more seconds on them. And I wasn't even trying. It's weird, isn't it? Some people can't do street races. Clearly, that's less of a problem for you because you just dropped it. And post, not exactly the biggest, fastest place either. I think Poe makes Monaco look relatively open. Yes, it does. And the funny thing with, with Paul is uh, a friend of mine, Stephen Watson, was racing, I think, for Durango at the time. 
and he said to me, hey, you know, he used to keep notes and we used to help each other and we were really close and he had a bunch of notes and we did a truck walk together and he said, you know, do this, break here, do that, go here, use this. And I basically went out, did that and I was P1 in practice. And after practice, he came and asked me, what are you doing? I'm like, what well, you told me? For some reason, we just had crazy speed. By that stage, you're racing in F3000 and, and all the Formula One teams are kind of looking at that and, and trying to see where the new talent is coming from, same as they do today. And you were already on the Formula One radar. By this stage, you were testing for Williams. What sort of step was it from a 3000 car? They were sort of pretty big and physical things you had to wrestle around. What was Formula One like at that stage in comparison? I was surprised at my first test drive. I remember I came out of the pits, I put it in fourth gear and I went wide open because I didn't know how much power there was going to be. So I thought I put a, I'll put a gear long enough that it's not going to spin the car or do anything stupid. And I got my foot down and it just went, oh, and I got to the rev limit and I'm going, oh, okay, where's the power? <laughs> <laughs> so from the power wise, I was kind of disappointed, but then you get on the brakes and you steer the car. And at the time it was like a big old, F3 car, you know, it was under power and it just had tons and tons and tons of grip. At that stage, did you think, okay, I, I'm kind of nearly there. Could you, could you almost reach out and touch F1? Did you think you were that close? I did. And when they signed Sonardi, I was very disappointed. I was very, very disappointed because I felt I had done enough through that year to, to get the seat. And when that didn't happen, I wasn't too pleased. But to every cloud, there's a silver lining. So the, the long story is Williams were introducing a new car and they wanted somebody with experience. Alex had just won two back-to-back car -back championships. And so Frank did a deal with Chip Ganassi that he would have Zanardi back in F1, where he'd been previous to kart with, with Lotus. And the other side of that coin was, well, Chip's going, well, who's going to drive for me? Well, we've got this young test driving kid from Colombia. You can have him. So you ended up being part of, as far as I'm aware, a unique driver swap where you were loaned to Chip Ganassi. Alex was loaned to Williams. And that was a whole different start to a whole different career. If, if that hadn't happened, it would have been a very different world for the last 20 years for you, wouldn't it? Yeah, the crazy thing with that is, I never knew that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> so you found out that they'd signed Alex. Then what? How did you find out you so were going to race cars? They told me they signed. So for me, it was they signed Alex, and we want you to come to the test and give Alex a hand. And I went, why am I, if he's so good, why am I going to give him a hand? I mean, you just signed him over me, so you're telling me he's a lot better than me. Why you need me? That was my response. So then when did they tell you? I mean, how did you find out about going to Ganassi and going to Kart? Um, that evening in the test, Chip came to me and said, hey, you want to race for me in the States? And I said, I, I mean, who, like at, at that point for me, F1 was out of the question because there was nothing. And, and with that in mind, I said, like, hell yes. So you headed off to the States. Now, th there was considerable history there. Nigel Mansell had left Formula One and, and gone and won in IndyCar or in kart. Uh, and, uh, and so too had Alex and been a double champion. And so there was, there was very much a recognition from the kart side that Formula One drivers could definitely cut the mustard or potential Formula One drivers. And I think in, in F1 circles, more maybe than there is now, it was seen that that was you know, an acceptable equal level of racing in the States. So you headed off to Ganassi and your debut season went pretty well. You ended up tied on points. Tied in points because in Australia, I, I was running P2 and I crashed. For me, you know, bidding Dario was more important than the, the points. So I threw it away. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. You threw it yeah, away in I surfers, mean, but the championship you still ended up as, as the youngest ever car champion at just 24 years of age. Yeah, I mean, it worked out, um, but it was, yeah, I mean, it's just young and experienced and just wanted to do whatever it took to win. 
And I think that's why people kind of like the way I raise and I do things because I just want to go as hard as I can and do whatever it takes to get the job done. So how did you find it then racing in the States for the first time? I mean, obviously you had previous experience, but not at that kind of level and with that kind of exposure as well, because when you go race for somebody like Chip Ganassi or Roger Penske, you can't kind of hide. Yeah, but it was, you know, Chip, the racing for Chip was a lot of fun. You know, I had so much fun and I have so much respect for him. It's unbelievable. You know, Chip is a, is a great guy. He's a guy that when he wants something, he's going to work for it. And, and, you know, I mean, as a boss, I, I had a lot of fun with him. And, we, you know, we, we had a lot of success together. So when you have success together, it makes it, makes it fun and makes it easy. The following season, though, 2000, Frank wanted you back in a Williams, but you wanted to stay with Chip. No, okay. uh, nothing. I, I oh. heard from halfway through 2000, um, they, Frank called me. Uh, this is like June or something. And it's uh, after I won the 500, like the month after I won the 500. And he said, hey, do you want to come to Formula One? And I said, well, you know, I have a contract here. And they said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. I said, okay. Okay, and that was it. Now you kind of breezed over after I won the 500. This was in the, the middle of the IRL cart split where Indianapolis Motor Speedway created their own single seater category up against cart. And Chip took you and your teammate, Jimmy Vassa, you were the first cart drivers to go and race after the split at the Indy 500, and you led 167 of the 200 laps. You won on your debut at the Brickyard. Now, you just kind of, you know, you walked straight by that. That's a huge deal. Did, did it become very quickly apparent how huge a deal that was? Uh, not really. Not really because, I don't know, I, I was so focused on the card championship, and for me, the card championship was so important that, that I felt like actually angry that we were going there and he was taking attention from, from all the issues we were having with, because in, in the other side, we switched to Toyota and to Alola and we had a lot of issues with both of them. Uh, we had a lot of engine failures, car failures. So I was really frustrated. So for me at that point, the, the Indy 500 was like a distraction more than something amazing. So then, off to Formula One. You spent four years at Williams. Uh, you had your first win in Monza, where we go later in the season. Your last in Brazil. You won in Monaco as well. And, and that was 2003, where Schumacher and Ferrari, Ferrari just won everywhere whenever they wanted, didn't they? So, so that must have been another special street race win for you. Yeah, I mean, to, to be, come, you know, being able to, to give Michael a hard time and Ferrari a hard time, as strong as they were at that time, was really nice. It was very difficult because they were so strong every week. You know, it was week in and week out. It's like, it was relentless. It's like, you know, what happens right now with Lewis and, and, and Mercedes is like, at some point you go, really? Again? So then from Williams, you moved to McLaren, which wasn't as competitive a car as maybe it should have been. And then you headed back to the US, you headed back to Chip Ganassi. Lots of racing drivers have at least one name that reappears like a thread through their careers. And your constant seems to be in Chip because you raced in kart and NASCAR for him. And he also introduced you into endurance racing, right? Yeah, I mean, I think, how do I explain this? But yeah, it, it's pretty much exactly what you're saying. It's Chip just kind of showed me endurance racing and... And it's something I wasn't expecting it, or I don't know how to say it. You know, I mean, it's something that it wasn't really in back of my mind. It was something that they used to kind of tell us, oh, you guys are going to do this. It wasn't like, you guys want to race this? No, this is what you're doing. An email would come late December, beginning of January, and say, I'll see you in a week. So it's... <laughs> email. I, and I'm not making it up. It, it was just <laughs> like that. It was like... I'll see you in a week, you know, and I remember I used to show up to the races and I wouldn't even know which car I was driving because they used to swap us every year 
I was like, okay, who's my teammate this year? So your first Daytona 24, you won it. Same as the Indy 500, you know, two of America's big three races. How much of a change of gear was it? You know, you're racing in kart, then you're racing in NASCAR, and then something like Daytona. That's that's a very, very different place to go racing, a very different style of racing to, to either of anything you've done before. Yeah, for, I like Daytona. Daytona is a nice place for the, you know, for Indians race. Um, it's very different than than the WEC. Uh, I think something that, in my opinion, Americans do a lot better is understanding that motorsports is an entertainment. Yes, it's a sport, but it needs to be entertaining for the fans. It needs to be good for the fans. It needs to be close racing for the fans. You know what I mean? They really focus on, you know, if you can put a safety car, you, they're gonna, they'll make sure they'll put a safety car, pack the pack. If you pit and you end up ahead of the, if, if you don't pit, you can wave around and get your lap back. And it just makes it, you know what I mean? My opinion of racing, it's cool when you end up with five or six cars at the end of the race on the same lead, on the same lap going for, for a win. Where in Le Mans and races like that, normally the leader is one or two laps ahead of the next guy and two laps ahead of the next guy and you're just hoping that something breaks in their car it's it's a different way of looking at the races so you won in 2007 you won again in 2008 your second sports car race ever and in 2009 very nearly won again 16 hundreds of a second you were beaten by in the in the car driven by david donahue so that's the closest ever Daytona oh yeah, with finish. that with that crazy Porsche. Yeah. Now, so that's three sports car races. You've already got two Rolexes, and you are within the tiniest gap to get a third straight, which is just ridiculous. Yeah, can't complain. <laughs> So you ended up doing a few more sports car races. You got another runner-up spot 2011. You got a third win in 2013. And with the exception of the Daytona 500, you've pretty much won what there is to win in US racing. Did you have, do you have a favorite discipline, would you say? Stock cars, indie cars, sports cars? Do they all tick different um, boxes? They're all different. They all have, the, every, you know, everything motorsport has is, is great things that you love about this sport and the things that you hate about it um you know what i mean it's it's always finding that balance between the politics you know what i mean like a you know like an f1 you know driving an f1 it's it's incredible but the amount of politics involved in the teams and everything especially when i was there it was insane so when you have so many politics it just kills the passion of why you're there um nascar is the other way you know the cars uh, they don't drive that well they don't do anything that well there's a lot of races um but the atmosphere is a lot of fun uh, you know everybody's really friendly and the racing itself it's really really good yeah so it's like where is a happy medium you know indycar seems to be a pretty decent happy medium um, it's difficult as they keep adding things for safety. That is uh, an obvious thing, but you know, I mean, it's tough because when there's no tire wars or anything, it makes it difficult. Look at right now with the with the good years in in WEC in the P2 cars. You know, they're trying to make a tire really, you know, have decent tire, but a slow tire, so you you know, so so the hyper cars are quicker than us. And it just it's a, it's a different formula that makes our cars don't drive that good. And, and it was a challenging experience, to be honest. Well, hypercar is in its infancy, isn't it? So those guys are definitely going to get quicker. What about the Triple Crown? Let's ask the Triple Crown question. Obviously, Fernando Alonso is chasing that, but with he's got two different cards in his hand to you. So the Triple Crown, winning the Indy 500, winning the Monaco Grand Prix, winning the Le Mans 24 hours. You've got the Indy, you've got the Monaco Grand Prix victory, you're chasing Le Mans, he's got Monaco and Le Mans, he's chasing Indy. Is Le Mans still very much on your to-do list? Is that something that you really want to have a good crack at? Oh, absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. 
you know, you of course you want to go. If you want to win overall today, you need to be in a Toyota. It's, you know, I mean, it's solely a reality of what it is. You know, if you're not in a Toyota, you're not going to win overall. Um, in a couple of years when the, all the manufacturers come, you know, hopefully they still look at me like somebody worth having in the car. And, and if they do, it would be amazing because I really want to try to win it. Do you sense that there's a lot of excitement in the States for Hypercar? Because obviously that's going to combine the IMSA version and the World Endurance Championship version of, of the two kind of extremes or, or the various different extremes. Uh, and it does seem that it has the potential to open up sports car racing globally. So if you have a car from a manufacturer, you can do... Daytona, Sebring, Petit Le Mans, Le Mans, you can race at Silverstone or Monza or, or Fuji or Bahrain or, or who knows where. And, and that's got to be good for the sport, for, for the teams and for the drivers who are all kind of trying to yeah, position I think, themselves. I think if the manufacturers do a good enough job and, and they sell enough, you know, it doesn't, if it's not only a factory run teams with the LMDH, it's going to become really cool because it's pretty much what P2 is today, but everybody going for overall wins. That, that's what everybody's looking for, isn't it? As kind of as wide open a playing field as possible. Actually, the way that the rules are, it, it just seems to me a little bit like the, the golden days of Can-Am. Do you want to bring hybrid? You can bring hybrid. You don't have hybrid. You don't have to have hybrid. You want it to look like a road car? It could look like a road car. Do you want it to look like a prototype? It can look like a prototype. It's essentially kind of sports car racing top tier run what you brung. And they're going to try and, and balance the whole thing together. But it does open up options for all sorts of different manufacturers, some of whom have already thrown their hat in the ring and, and some of whom are probably circling just to see exactly how good it's going to get. So for, for teams and, and for drivers like yourself, the potential of, a, of another kind of boost to the, to the sports car racing uh, fraternity i think is enormous exactly so we'll see i mean it's uh, you know there's next few years are pretty exciting for endurance racing and you know we'll see how everything develops how the manufacturers develop and how everybody comes about it you know what i mean your first trip to le mans you finished on the podium and there were lots of fans last year again racing behind closed doors as we have been you know for over a year now and you you had the other the other side of lady luck the car retired so how much different do you think Le Mans is to Daytona obviously to the layman they're both 24-hour races but they can't possibly be more different could they no they couldn't be more different um the the hard thing with you know Le Mans as I said before the only thing and it's for the, the typical you know what they call the purest that the race is the race but, you know, if you end up in the wrong safety car, you, you know, I mean, you end up losing half a lap. And if you, you know, I mean, it's a lot of luck involved in how things pan out and what works and what doesn't, you know, it's. Uh, but as a race and as an experience, it, it's so much fun. The racing there, honestly, the track is so cool, so challenging. It's so fun. And particularly when you went there for the first time with the fans, with the driver's parade and all of that, that must have felt a little bit like, oh, here's a little touch of American showmanship going on as well uh, around the whole of the event. Yes, exactly. So it's it was nice. We'll see what happens this year with the fans and with everything. And, you know, here in the States, everything is starting to open now. But so, you know, I mean, we watch, uh, what did we watch yesterday? A NASCAR race. and. There were like 35% of, of people there already. Um, well, I mean, honestly, here it's like you couldn't even tell there's a pandemic going on anymore. So your target for this year in the IMSA series is to try and defend your title. What about in the World Endurance Championship? What do you think you would see as a, a goal for 2021? Um, so for, for IMSA, for me, I'm really just running the, the, the long races. And, and for 21 with, with Dragon Speed, it's, I think it's, you know, see what, you know, we're going for the Pro-Am class. Uh, I think we got a potential there to win that championship. And, you know, we're going to give it the best. You know, we want to, I want to try to help uh, everybody, you know, Elton and everybody at Dragon Speed build, build that team up and, and see what the future brings. 
That's it for this episode of WEC Talk, the podcast series from the FIA World Endurance Championship. My thanks to our guest, Juan Pablo Montoya. We'll be back soon with another episode. So until then, stay safe and thank you for listening. Thank you.